Yeah. So they think, you know, you got these guys. And that's the moment I picture, Mike, is like all of this motley crew of prisoners and Wehrmacht guys and GIs. And they're all up there. Oh, the SS guy, right? The captain, he's up there and they're firing at the SS. And but they, you know, they know they can't stop them because they got freaking anti-aircraft guns. And then they hear the squeal of the tanks coming behind them yeah. from Kramers. And the and the and the SS realize we're f Welcome everybody to another great episode of uh WTF History. Um we're Mike and I, my co-host Mike Gatto. Um I'm David Quintana, and we come up with what we believe are history stories that make you say, What the f um, and I think we do a good job, and we really want to. We really want to thank everybody who is subscribing, all of the viewers, everybody who's enjoyed our our episodes. Um, if you're thinking about it right now, if you're watching this, why don't you go ahead and subscribe, hit a like, tell somebody about it. But we're really proud of how much this has grown. So um, we're just two two dudes who love history, man. Um, so today, what we have for you are we have World War II stories. Um, Kind of surprising, Mike, that you don't have a Roman story, but um, I'm sure you'll work the Romans and or Italians into it somehow. Uh, but Mike, why don't, why don't you go first? So my WTF story today is the story of Hans Ulrich Rudel, who was a World War II German bomber pilot. And I want to say at the outset, or we want to say at the outset, that um, this is a show about amazing historical facts. And the career of Hans Ulrich Rudel is certainly amazing for his combination of resilience and, quite frankly, luck. But we should also be clear that he was an unrepentant Nazi. And of course, by being amazed and expressing our amazement at his fascinating and unique role in history, of course, we do not endorse his beliefs. So, David, I have a question for you. Do you watch, I know you love history. Do you watch the show Masters of the Air? It's an Apple TV show. Show. I do not. Okay. So for those of you out there who do, you guys know, this is a show about U.S. bomber crews during World War II. And if you watch the show, you know that they're obsessed with the number 25. They talk about 25 all the time. They're talking about 25 missions. And why? Why were they obsessed with 25 missions? David, do you know why? Um, because is that when they qualified for some sort of pay? No, it was at 25 bomb bombing missions, uh, U.S. bomber crews could go home. It's that simple. If you had completed 25 crews, you could go home. Now, in, 19, oh, okay. in late 1944, that number was raised to 30 missions. And toward the end of the war, some crews, it was raised to 35. But for most of the war, if you were a U.S. bomber crew, after 25 missions, you could go home. But um, now, some very brave ones re-enlisted. Uh, the most notable is Rosie Rosenthal, legendary pilot, who, um, who re-enlisted after doing his 25 missions. Um, as far as I could tell from my research, most of the most uh, hard-taxed U.S. bomber pilots, uh, the ones that flew the most missions in the war, flew somewhere in the range of 50 to 60 missions. Uh, maybe a handful of, did that, maybe three or four or five. Now, why 25 missions? Well, that's because the odds of death were so great. Um, again, it's hard to get accurate estimates. I'm not sure that there could ever be accurate estimates, but most sources I looked at say that the odds of going up, or the odds of death every time you went up in the air on a bomber mission in World War II was roughly one in 20, 5% chance, right? So what was so magical about the number 25 missions? Well, you had cheated death. You would simply cheat to death. You had gone up more times than you should be alive, right? I like that. So we're going to start with the first WTF statistic about Hans Ulrich Rudel, the German dive bombing pilot. He flew 2,530 missions. 2,530 missions. And almost all of them he did in a Stuka dive bomber. And almost all of them were on the Eastern Front. Now, I... David, you know what a Stuka is, right? Okay, so this is the iconic, you know, German dive bomber of World War II. It had a horn of Jericho on it, of course, and that was that 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 noisemaker that when it went into a dive, it went wah, right, and made that siren noise. And David, do you know why they had horns of Jericho on them? Um, to scare the birds out of the way. 
Yeah. Wrong again. Good guess. It was simply to stoke terror in oh. the target. That's it. It it had that that siren, the Horn of Jericho, on it, simply uh, as yeah. a means of inducing terror. Well, that's you know into honestly, the force. That, that that theory, not that theory, but that element in combat has gone on since the beginning of time. It has, right? yeah. That's right. Of, of people who they bang on things or they make you know wild noises to simply to stoke fear, right? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And the Stuka folks, I mean, you know, aviation folks know this stuff. It was slow. It was heavy. It was, it had fixed landing gear that never retracted. Um, and, and the way that the Stuka was flown and the way that it was meant to be flown is you would zero in on a target. The pilot would zero in on a target and the pilot would go vertical. It would go into the dive and head straight toward the ground, uh, which the, the goal was, you know, you would make a smaller target of yourself rather than flying like this. You were flying at a target yeah, yeah, like yeah. this. And it was also for greater precision, right? I mean, you could hit a target as small as a tank if you needed to. Um, you would have to dive to the target like a madman. And again, Hansel Recruiter flew 2,530 missions. So let's go into his crazy story. So in 1940, he enlists in the German Air Force, and he really, really wanted to be a fighter pilot. Um, but he was rejected to be a fighter pilot, which is fascinating when you hear the rest of his story, because his, his aviation skills were amazing. Um, so he entered the dive bomber squad, which was more dangerous, right? Um, and on his sixth mission is when this legend of Hans Ulrich Rudel really started. Um, so on his sixth mission, it came over the radio that the Russians were um, had positioned a battleship called the Murat, um, which was outside of Leningrad. And it was shelling the heck out of the German troops there. So they called the Air Force to help out, and uh, Hans Ulrich Rudel took off. Now, the Stuka was a two-seater. So, uh, so a lot of this testimony comes from his second-in-command. Um, as they approached the Murat, he ordered his second-in-command to take the dive brakes off. And folks, again, um, you got to understand that the Stuka was equipped with a set of dive brakes. These were special flaps that basically prevented the plane from entering terminal velocity and crashing into the target. So he ordered his second in command to leave them off for the dive that he was about to do at this battleship. And his co-pilot later testified that they got so close to the surface of the battleship that they could see the Russian sailors' mouths gaping in amazement. Like, right? And um, so Rudel positioned his plane. He went into his dive. He got so close to the ammunition hold of this Russian battleship. And because he was able to get so close, he delicately dropped two bombs. They later testified, like a bird lays an egg. He dropped two bombs into the Murat's ammunition hold. And then he had to use all of his strength to pull the stick back up to get out of this crazy dive. Right? His wheels actually skimmed the water as they, oh, they got out of the dive and tried to climb back up. And when they pulled back up to flying height, they looked back, as did the rest of the German Air Force, and they saw that the Murat battleship had cratered in half. Mm -hmm. uh, Hans Ulrich Rudel became the only pilot in history to single-handedly take out a battleship. Okay, So for this, he was awarded the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross. Now, David, do you know about this medal? No. I know you served in the military. So, so Originally, the Iron Cross was the highest award in German armed forces, and it went back quite some time. It was originally only ordered to officers. And the Iron Cross was the equivalent of the Medal of Honor. It was the highest thing that a soldier could really expect to get for near suicidal bravery under combat conditions. But so many folks won it during the first couple of years of World War II that they had to create a new award, and they created the Knight's Cross and the Iron Cross, or they had to really try to establish this new award, the Knight's Cross and the Iron Cross. They, they they had like honor inflation. They they did they did and um and but this Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross really was the equivalent of the Medal of Honor. It was won by very few people, and it was for suicidal bravery under combat conditions. So Hans Ulrich Rudel was awarded this for his daring, and they offered to make him a an instructor, um, but he refused. He said, "No, I want to go back to combat." And he quickly became really really well known for destroying enemy material. After destroying his 100th tank in battle, he was awarded the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross with oak leaves and swords. And he, this was one of only 160 awarded during the whole duration of World War II. And the brass said to him, 
his commanding officer and you know the, the politicians in the Third Reich said to him, you know, you are such a national hero. Um, we are going to command you to retire and we want you to go on a speaking circuit because it would utterly destroy morale if you were killed in battle. Mm -hmm. um, so he tore the medal off of his uniform, uh, placed it on the desk and walked out and returned to combat. And he became such a legendary destroyer of tanks that Joseph Stalin himself put a bounty of a million dollars on his head for any Russian pilot who could take him out or any ground fire who could take him out. And folks, I want you to understand a million dollars in 1942 is roughly $105 million today. That's how much his destruction meant to Joseph Stalin. You remember what we said at the beginning, um, U.S. bombers could go home after 25 missions um, because your odds of getting shot down were so great. After flying his 15, 1500th mission, he was shot down for the seventh time. Okay. Now, this time, he was shot down 30 miles behind enemy lines, and they had no weapons, no support. And this didn't stop this guy because he was a crazy, crazy, crazy dude. He led his team on a desperate run through three freezing cold temperatures, you know, wearing their flight suits. They evaded Russian patrols. And they covered 30 miles in just over 24 hours. You think about that, how, how tough that would be. It's basically running at a marathon pace almost. Um, or yeah, definitely a marathon pace in 24 hours, as best as you can. Um, he finalized his escape by jumping into the Dnieper River and swimming 600 yards through ice cold water uh, to get to a German base on the other side. He closed with boots, I'm sure. No, I think they took it off, which is even more crazy. Oh, but. Yeah. So, you know, after this, Rudel was awarded the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross with oak leaves, swords, and diamonds. And this was one of only 27 awarded in all of World War II for all the German armed forces. And again, the German political leadership insisted that he quit. They said to him, dude, you've flown 1,500 missions. On your 1,500th mission, you were shot down for the seventh time. Um, you know, there's a million dollar bounty on your head. This would destroy morale if you were to be killed. So, you know, like, especially because you're one of the highest awarded soldiers, um, you know. So he said, oh, all right, the award means that much. Tore it off his uniform, placed it on the desk, went back to combat. Um, I want to pause for a minute and talk about his statistics. His 2,530 combat missions were more than any pilot for any country in any period of time. And it's a record that will never be broken. They, they probably won't even break it. You know, they, won't, they won't even come 125th as close. Uh, what's amazing is that this bomber pilot who flew a slow, shitty, outdated piece of technology also became a fighter ace because he shot down. He had 11 aerial kills of enemy aircraft in his slow, clunky Stuka. On the ground, he destroyed over 1,000 transports, 519 tanks, 150 anti-aircraft batteries, 70 landing craft, four armored combat trains, whatever that is, uh, two cruisers, a destroyer, and of course the battleship that we mentioned. And he was beloved by other pilots. Um, fascinating stat that I found about Hans Ulrich Rudel, he quit drinking for the duration of the war. So he wanted to stay sharp. You know, you're, you're flying, you know, two missions a day for six years. You got to be pretty sharp. So all across the German Air Force, you know, in their, in their drinking halls, they had a toast. And the, tro the toast basically went, you know, they would raise their glass and they would say, this, is, this drink goes out to Hans Ulrich Rudel. He drinks only Sprudel, which, you know, Sprudel is a German term for sparkling, you know, sparkling mineral water, right? And they were basically saying he stays so sharp so that we can be here drinking and he saved our lives and so on and so forth. Um, Rudel flew through bouts of jaundice um, and other illnesses. He never made an excuse. He suited up and uh, got up there and fought. He would routinely land behind enemy lines and picked up his and pick up down comrades. If he saw a plane go down, he saw a parachute, he would just land in the middle of a battle and he'd pick the guy up and take off again and bring the guy to safety. Um, he he was always just, you know, out all the time. He just he just uh, that's the way he did it. Uh, he wrote an autobiography and he talks about, he talks about one day where the command told him, Hey, we need you to, uh, to guard this small city that's being just absolutely destroyed by the Russians and they're killing the civilians and so on and so forth. And he looked down at the orders and it was his hometown. Mm. And, uh, he, he stayed up fighting for three days straight, 
during that battle, desperate attempt to save his hometown, which of course later fell to the Russians. On another episode, he saw a Russian tank column doing a sneak attack towards German lines. Nobody else was aware of it. He radioed base. They said, hey, buddy, you're all we've got. He flew, he made pass after pass on the tank column until he ran out of ammunition and fuel and had to crash land. But he stopped the tanks dead in their tracks from attacking his guys. Um, Hungary and Italy also gave him medals. Um, but the greatest WTF moment we still haven't covered. February 8, 1945, he was shot down for the 30th time. 30 times shot down. And this time, enemy fire blew his leg off. So shortly thereafter, he's presented the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross with oak leaves, swords, and diamonds in solid gold. They actually invented this new decoration for him. He yeah, was the only... They named it after him at a certain point. They should have. They should have. Yeah. Uh, he was the only recipient of this award in history. Um, I want to be clear, this was amidst a lot of tough battles and tough folks, this guy was, was the equivalent of winning the Medal of Honor five times. So this was the fifth time that he won the Medal of Honor for getting his leg blown off. Now, again, the German high command said to him, hey, Hans, you know, you got shot down for the 30th time. Um, you know, you're the most decorated soldier in the history of warfare. You really ought to hang it up. It would really destroy morale if you got killed. He ripped off the medal and he went back to combat. He got fitted with a prosthetic leg and was back in the air a month later. And the crazy thing is that he notched several of his last victories with a prosthetic leg. Now, a few months later, of course, came the end of the war, and he was ordered to surrender. He battled his commanding officer for a little bit, but his commanding officer ordered him to surrender, which he did over his objections. He flew to a U.S. base in Prague and, um, you know, signaled he was there to surrender. And the U.S. base, they were doing DNC, drone ceremony. And when he landed, you know, of course, he had this gigantic ego. He said, oh, you, you brought out a parade for me. And they're like, no, we're just doing DNC. But when they found out who he was, you know, all of the airmen wanted to shake his hand and have a meal with him and, uh, you know, break bread with him. And he did. He sat there and, you know, he was mobbed for like a day when everybody, you know, wanted his autograph and wanted to break bread with him. Apparently, at some point, you know, some young American said something about being a better pilot. And he just laughed and said, you know, something like, son, you know, if you think you're a better pilot, I'll get up in my Stuka right now and you know, we can dogfight. And the guy, the guy, of course, did not take him up on his offer, which is really fascinating. Um, after the war, you know, like so many other Nazis, he moved to Argentina. And, but the fascinating thing is that the United States actually reached out to him and asked him for his help in designing the A-10 Warthog, which was a plane that was modeled after the Stuka. Yeah, roughly. makes a noise. Yep, yep, makes a noise. It's tough, it's armored, it's slow, Gear but the right. troops love it, you know? Um, and, and, and here's another fascinating statistic. Despite having only one leg, or, you know, a prosthetic leg, he became a downhill ski champ, you know, because, of course, right? It's, it's as if he's living in a Bond movie. Uh, Rudel died at age 66 in 1982. And here's a fascinating tidbit about his life. You know, of course, he led a very stressful life. You wonder what six years, 2,530 missions do to someone's stress levels and everything like that. So he died at 66, relatively early. Um, a fascinating tidbit. His exploits, although really amazing, right? I mean, amazing, courageous, lucky, whatever you want to say, they were never celebrated because he was such a devoted Nazi. And yeah. we stress again that us today expressing amazement at his combat record, which is amazing, is uh, and are being impressed with his courage. That is a human trait. And of course, we do not endorse anything that he stands for. But Germany wanted nothing to do with him. Um, they actually would not allow any military honors at his funeral because he was so uh, devoted to World War II cause. But in 1982, two modern German Air Force pilots took planes unauthorized off the base and flew over his funeral in a missing man formation as one last tiny, you know, honor to this guy's courage because he had saved, you know, so many of his guys in such an awful cause. But what an amazing WTF career yeah. that was. Is one that'll never be it, 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 honestly shameful. I, I had no idea that this guy existed. I understand why. I understand the politics of the issue, uh, which is probably why I had never heard of him. But yeah, I mean, that's just, that that is amazing that a pilot could go through that many missions. 
That is crazy. No one will ever get close to that guy. Not even close. Not even close. I mean, it's just so amazing when you look at the statistics, like missions flown, you know, material destroyed, uh, aerial kills. I mean, it's just amazing that folks were able to, whenever you're flying and you get nervous, just think about this guy. <laughs> think yeah, about, right. you know, yeah. He was able to land his plane behind enemy lines while being shot at at 1940, you know, technology. But uh, Yeah, and I think people forget, we used the term dive bomber, but we don't. Like the meaning of what a dive bomber, or the origin of what a dive bomber is has been lost in time. Yeah. But it's it's interesting for you to talk about it because, yeah, they were planes that actually dived. <laughs> right. That gave them what they felt was a tactical advantage in, in the bomb. Yeah. So it was a literal dive bomber. Uh, but you hear it all the time, right? Oh, they're going to dive bomb. And it's like. Yeah. And, and the thought that this guy had to flow straight, uh, had to fly straight at the ground 2,500 times is like, <laughs> and lived. Like, it's just totally wild. And I believe, though, that you've got a World War II story, too, for us. I do. That is fascinating. Uh-huh. And I'm not going to... How do you know what my story is? I have told you. Because you told me that it's a really good one, and I trust you now. I probably okay. I should have. Okay. You'll put us all to sleep. Honestly, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. This story that I'm going to tell you, my WTF story, is one in which I smiled broadly, and I actually teared up. This story should be a movie. And Mike, you and I are both rich guys. We can get the rights to this story. I it is beyond me that this has not been a major motion picture yet. So this uh, is another bear? Uh, not another bear. They, okay. they did make a movie on that one. <laughs> this is maybe one of the greatest one day battles I have ever heard of. It has everything, and I'm already casting it in my head. <laughs> um, so we're not going to go very far. We're going to go to Austria to North Tyrol in a village called Itter. Is this the Battle of Castle? Itter? It's the the Battle of Itter Castle. Yes. Uh, Last days of the war. Last days of the war. This is one of the greatest stories I've ever fell upon. It's amazing to me that I had not heard of this story before. Because like I said, I both, it has everything. It has French nobles it has SS officers. Yeah. It has rugged GIs fresh from Battle of the Bulge. It has, you know, good-hearted Wehrmacht German army guys. It's got everything, man. And it all happens in one day. I know. So it, in, in, in North Tyrol, there is a village called um, Itter. It's a very, very small village. There's actually a larger one called um, Wurgel. Wurgel is like four or five miles from the little town of the little little village of Inner. But in Inner, there is a castle. And it's called the Inner Castle. It's been around for centuries, but it was redone in the 1800s. And it, if you look at a picture of, of the Inner Castle, you'll see that it's a very formidable looking castle. Like if you were to design a castle to be defended, like this is it. The other thing to remember with the Inner Castle is that it is surrounded on three sides by incredibly steep, hilly terrain. Um, and the only way to get into the Inter Castle is a bridge with a gatehouse, and that will get you into the Inter Castle. Um, in 1938, the Germans decided, uh, well, the, first the Germans, um, they annexed Austria. I think a lot of people don't realize that. I think a lot of people, you know, well, Austria was Germany, but no, Germany, quote unquote, annexed them. Um, and then at that time, the Germans decided to lease the Inter Castle from the owner. Um, but in 1943, well, in 1940, they decided to, 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 to lease it. And then in 1943, Heinrich Himmler, who was, you know, with the SS and was working on the death camps, he decided to um, seize it. So he seized the Inter Castle, Himmler, and he turned it into a sub camp um to Dachau, which was Dachau was like I think fifty miles away from Inter from the Inter Castle. Uh, just south of Munich, right? Mm-hmm. And so so he turned it into a VIP camp. And for those of you who don't follow history a lot, look, this has gone on from since the beginning of time. Um not all prisoners are treated equally. Not everybody who's captured, you know, in a village or on the field are treated equal. In fact, you know, it was much bigger earlier on, like during the Crusades, when they would capture somebody, you held them in a castle and you wanted ransom, right? But you treated those people differently. And many times those people were all interrelated and, you know, they had to be sure. 
So what happened, though, was when the Germans came through, they took a lot of the people from the Australian upper, cra- upper class, um, former prime ministers, former marshals of the, of the military, um, and they put them in the Inter Castle. And they were there as a kind of a, let's call it a VIP concentration camp. And then they had other people that they had uh, assigned from the Dachau camp um, who were kind of, you know, low-level guys that had skills like um, there was, uh, you know, carpenters, uh, cooks, and they had those prisoners work there with the VIP uh, French and Austrian um, uh, VIP guys. And so in the in the VIP castle, um, Mike, it included people such as, but not limited to, um, uh, world tennis star Jean Barotra, uh, former French prime minister is Reynaud and Deladier, former military chiefs Gamelin and Wagon, uh, Charles de Gaulle's elder sister, and the numerous labor and business leaders. They were all kept there, all told, you know, there were probably about 100 people there. They honestly had a kind of run of the castle. They were there with SS troops, uh, Waffen SS troops, and um, the SS was in charge. Uh, but they were treated, you know, as befits the the society in which they came. They could not leave, though, right? They couldn't leave, but they, they had to stay there. Uh, for those people who aren't familiar with how the the German military went in World War II, um, the Waffen S. So you had the SS, right? That was kind of the elite paramilitary part, more political part, right, Mike, of the German army. Well, I was going to say, let, let me work in a Roman reference, because you always tell me that I do. So let me do it. Let me work in a Roman reference. Are you going to say that they were the uh, guards? Yeah, they were like the Praetorian Guard. I mean, yeah. the, the best yeah. way to think about it, right, is that the right. the German military leadership or the German political leadership wanted to create a force that really answered mostly to them and owed their loyalty to them. So this would be like in Roman times, there were the legions, which could, in theory, go south, and they could owe their allegiance to a popular general. But then they also had the Praetorian Guard, which owed its allegiance directly to the emperor. This is really, I think, what the Waffen SS was. Mm-hmm. It was a weaponized, you know, militarized police force, essentially, that ended up fighting a lot of enemies. And they, yeah. were, they were fanatics. Yes, that's right. They were. They were the most zeal- They were the most zealous of all of them. And they had they ran the castle. Um, they ran the inner castle and they were also out in the field because remember, if you remember, um, and you shouldn't remember because I haven't mentioned it yet, but our story takes place on the end of April and beginning of May of 1940, 1945. So for those of you who know, these are the very final days of the war. Um, the war was was coming to an end here. Um, am I right, Mike? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so pretty much the only people left, right, were the true believers, like, like the, the Waffen SS. So they they had control. They were in the countryside at this time. The Waffen SS were going out on uh, patrols to to just frighten, terrorize. They were going after people they thought were traitors, and they were just really taking. They were wreaking havoc upon the countryside for anybody that they felt might not be carrying the party line. Because remember, they were a very political paramilitary group. Um, then you had the Wehrmacht. The Wehrmacht was like the normal army. And by the way, when I say normal army, I'm not excusing anything they did because there probably were very many people who had the same horrible thoughts that the SS people had in the Wehrmacht. But what I mean by that is I'm just trying to say that was like the army that people were recruited into. Sure. The, the that, Wehrmacht, you could be drafted into. Yeah. This you could was be the drafted. regular army, regular folks. The SS, you had to prove your allegiance. You had to be a fanatic. They had height and weight requirements, fitness requirements. And you had to prove your German ancestry going back to like the 1700s. If you were in the German SS, there were units of Ukrainian SS. There were units of French SS, which is crazy. Uh, Norwegian SS. I mean, it's fascinating, fascinating history. But these were the zealots. Yes. So think of them as like the politically driven zealots of, of the army. And as you said, the Praetorian Guard, right? And they kind of were the Praetorian Guard. They were the last folks standing in this in this war. Um, and many of them didn't even ever give up. They all went to Argentina. Many went to Argentina and Brazil. Um, so, so what happened is um, on August, on April 29th, on April 29th, the, the U.S. was slowly, slowly closing in. Because remember, we had, we had D-Day, and it was just a slow march toward the inevitable after that. Um, but on the 29th of April, the U.S. liberated the Dachau concentration camp. 
and all of the SS guards there were, you know, rightfully either killed in place or they escaped or they were taken prisoner. Um, there was a commandant by the name of Vital, and Vital like escaped, and he came to the castle. He went to the uh, to the Itter Castle, um, the sub camp with all the VIPs, and he met with Vimmer, who was the commandant of the Itter Castle. And I think at that point, people started to realize, oh, shit, gigs up, right? Yeah. We're we're this this is this whole thing's falling down at our feet. And the next morning, they found him, or on I'm sorry, not the next morning, but on May second. Um, they found uh, a Vital was dead. Uh, he had shot himself in the head at the castle. Um, after that happened, Vimmer, who was the commandant of the castle, him, he, and all of the SS troops, all of the Waffen SS troops that were running the castle, they left. They left. They left behind their guns. They all left, and they left like a hundred, a hundred of these VIP, primarily French prisoners now, um, in the courtyard in the castle. And they knew that they were surrounded by panzer divisions of SS. And they were like, oh, geez, what do we do now? I mean, glad they're gone, but now what? Um, word got back to the people um, through communications in the field. Word got back that a panzer division of uh, Baffin SS were on their way to Itter Castle with the orders to destroy every human being in the castle. So essentially, it was like, if we're going, you're going. And so the Panzer Division of the Bothan SS was working its way through the forests of North Tyrol towards Itter Castle. So, you know, the, 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 the prisoners are like, what do we do? Um, so thankfully, they had firearms, right? And remember, these were like all older aristocratic, you know, uh, older guys, right? Ambassadors, former prime ministers. So, I mean, I'm sure they can shoot a gun, but I don't know how long they can hold up. So they decided, okay, let's let's send out somebody with an English note. Uh, so they sent out Kukovic, who was a Croat, on a bike, and he went to uh, he went to uh, uh, he went to the close village. It, it was held by the SS. They had created roadblocks, so he decided, no, this ain't gonna happen. So he he took his bike all the way to Innsbruck, and in Innsbruck he found a bunch of U.S. troops, and he said, hey, we've got a bunch of VIPs in Inner Castle. We really need your help. Can you help us? And they said, hey, let's go. Remember, these guys who just came off Battle of the Bulge, D-Day, they were on a hot streak. They were on a, hey, we want to kill Germans. Let's go. And they were ready to go, right? At the same time, the French had not heard back, right, from the guy. So they were like, okay, he's probably dead. Let's have a plan B. Well, there was an S, a Waffen SS officer, uh, Captain Schrader, and they had befriended him. He had kind of lost interest. Um, in the whole fight, and he just wanted to wait it out with him and his family. He had been wounded. While wounded, he had been back and forth to Inter Castle, and be he had befriended many of the people there. Um, so they said, "Look, we're going to have to defend ourselves. Let's go. Let's go." We know that um, Captain Schrader, even though he's SS, I think he's like us. Let's go to town and let's talk to him and let's see if he can come help us fortify the castle. So they went, and a Bothan SS guy. Captain Schrader said, I'm with you. Let's go. I'll help. Wow. So he came back to the castle, and he helped them fortify their defenses. He shored up the weak spots. He taught them how to shoot the guns right. Right. He taught them what to do and how to be a, a you know, as best they could, a fighting force. Remember, these were old guys. So now we have a bunch of French and some Austrian, you know, prisoners, and they've got an SS captain <laughs> who's, like, helping them get their army together. I feel like the Alamo, right? Sure. And so, meanwhile, they can hear more and more of the uh, more and more of the uh, Panzer division closing in on the castle because you know the tanks and and they had uh, they had anti aircraft guns, so they had really big guns. Um. So there was a Wehrmacht major named Gongol. Now Gongol is very important in this. Major Gongol had begun to get disillusioned also with the whole fight. He was Wehrmacht, right? He wasn't an SS guy. Sure. As people will probably note in the comments, he could have been just as evil as them. I don't know. Maybe he was. I, it's not important to the storyline here, but we'll we'll give you that. I'm not trying to make him an angel. Gangle had kind of withdrawn from the Wehrmacht. Uh, not, he didn't withdraw from the Wehrmacht, but he wasn't into the fight anymore. And he had be actually begun to collaborate with the Austrian resistance in the town. Wow. So he had begun to, to collaborate them and work with the Austrian resistance in Wargle. And um, 
while he was there, the one of the second folks that they sent out when they didn't hear from the other guy, uh, they sent another guy, a cook, and he found Gangle in Wargle. And he said, look, we got to do something. We're in trouble here. Um, we need your help. Can you and your Wehrmacht guys come and help us? Uh, because the Austrian resistance had, had put them together with Gangle. And he's like, look, it's going to take a lot more than me. Let's see if there are some Americans around. This is all happening on one day, by the way. This is all, <laughs> this is all happening on the 4th. So he's like, it's going to take a lot more than me. Let's see if we can find some Americans. So Gangle, under the flag of surrender, he went north and he found a tank division of America wow. led by uh, uh, Captain Jack Lee. So Captain Jack Lee was in Kufstein on the 4th of May and Gengel met up with him. And so but Jack Lee had a tank battalion, battle ready, a squadron of men. And he said, look, here's where we're at. I know I'm German. I know I'm Wehrmacht. I'm with you guys, right? And they made the Wehrmacht guys put a put a towel, uh, put a rag around their arm, a black rag, to ensure that they were one of the they were with them. And he's like, I know it's going to sound crazy, but there's a bunch of French, uh, you know, kind of upper class prisoners in Intercastle. The SS is encroaching upon them, and they're about to wipe them all out. They have orders to kill all of them. That, that's what this guy just told me. We need your help. Let's do this. We'll team up with you. You know, can I can I help you get there? And of course, Jack Lee, fresh from battle, said, "Hell yeah, let's do this!" Right. Well, by the way, he did have a cigar. That of he course. And he did have a forty-five strapped to his to his thigh. Of course. All fact. Um. So they got in. He had four tanks. Um. And so they start down to Vorgel. So they got to Vorgel, right, which was the small village before Itter. And the Austrian resistance said, no, 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 you need to leave some tanks with us. You need to leave us three of your tanks because we need protection here if you're going to do this. So Jack Lee is like, there's no way I'm going to go protect this castle and liberate these people with one tank and like these dudes, right? Yeah. And because he wasn't working with the Germans at this time, they were just helping him get them. Uh, but so his ragtag guys, right, his squadron, he's like, I, you know, I'm not going to do that. And they're like, and so Gangle tells Jack Lee, look, if you leave some of your tanks here with these guys to defend their town, um, my Wehrmacht guys will go with you and we'll fight together. And they wow. like, let's do this. And so so they took their one tank. They uh, they took uh, one tank called uh, the Bosch Buster, which I love, and huh. they put the Bosch Buster on the bridge into Wargle to try and uh, either lead any resistance, any reinforcements, or stop any resistance. And they left two other tanks there, and they got on his tank, uh, the Basatin Betty, and yeah. they took the Basatin Betty and the German troops and the remainder of his troops, and they started towards Itter. They got to Itter. Um, the Wehrmacht soldiers, the American GIs, their one tank, the Basatin Betty, and they looked up and they saw the SS guy, um, they saw the you know the SS captain, and they realized, oh, he's with them. Because then they saw the prisoners get up and go like, no, 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 he's with them. And what's funny is that it's so on brand that the French guys were disappointed that that's all they sent. The <laughs> French people were like, what? This is it? <laughs> These are our rescuers? <laughs> they, were like, they were actually it's so funny. Like, you know, very on brand. So what they did is they left the Basat and Betty in the gate, in the gate. That's the one gate because he had to go over one bridge and he had the gate. So Captain Jack Lee left the Basat and Betty there in the doorway of the gate. Him, his ragtags, the GIs, the Wehrmacht soldiers with Gangle, they all go in. They download with the SS officer who helped create right the defenses here for the for the prisoners. And the first thing Jack Lee says, he's like, "Hey, you guys, the you know prisoners, you guys need to go in the basement because this is going to get real." And I don't huh. want to see you guys getting killed. And they were like really pissed because they wanted to fight. And he's like, no, you guys go in the basement. It's going to get ugly. So they all get their positions. And now the Panzer Division of the Waffen SS has reached the walls of Inner Castle. And they start hitting it with 18 millimeter, 20 millimeter anti aircraft shells. So you could imagine what's happening. I mean, the castle is just rocking. It's, we're still on the fourth, by the way. Um, so the castle is still rocking. Anti aircraft is hitting, right? So one of the anti-aircraft, uh, uh, you know, uh, shells hit the Basat and Betty, 
in the gate oh, and wow. blew the tank up. So what happened though is at this point, the um, the so the prisoners who were in the basement they said, "F this, we're not gonna, we're not going to sit here and die." They just blew up the Basad and Betty, and so right. they all went. These old ambassadors, these old prime ministers, you know, the tennis star, the Gaul sister. They all went and got the SSR, you know, with the guns they had left behind, and they all took up positions. In fact, the prime minister, Renan, he went behind the Basat and Betty in the courtyard, and he set up with a machine gun because he was going to fight. Gangel sees Renan in, in the courtyard. He's like, no, you can't sit there. You're going to get killed. And so he runs over to push Renan out of the way, and he gets hit in the head by a sniper. Jeez. He dies. So the, ma the, 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 the major who had put this whole thing to get, together with the Wehrmacht, Right, he gets hit in the head by a sniper and he dies. By the way, he ended up being the only uh, death on that side. So he's now dead. They're trying to fortify. People are starting to get very worried. They're thinking, okay, it's over now. We're gonna we're we're dead. In the middle of all this, Jack Lee hears a phone ring. This is what I'm saying. This is a damn movie, Mike. <laughs> Jack Lee hears a phone ring in the castle. He goes answers a phone, and it's a guy named Major Kramer's. And Major Kramers is in Warhol, and he's like, hey, I'm here with the reinforcements. I got my tank division, and I got a whole bunch of GIs that want to kill some Germans. How do we get there? And in the middle of the conversation, the SS cuts the phone line. And so now they're like, Jesus Christ, we got, we got a tank division, you know, in Warhol, ready to come out here. But they don't know how to get here. They don't have the intel, right? right. Remember the tennis star I told you about in the beginning? Yes. So the tennis star, a world-class athlete, goes, you know what, guys? I can do this. I can vault the castle wall, right? He's a world-class athlete. And he's like, I can this is a movie. This is a movie. This is a movie. He's like, I can figure this shit out. I can vault the wall. Like, not in one leap, right? But, you know. And, um, and then I can, I can get past that line. Like, I'm fast. I'm an athlete. I can do this. And they're like, dude, you can't do this. He's like, watch me. And so... What he does is, um, John Barotra, what he does, the, the, the tennis star, is he jumps over, right? Again, not one leap. He gets over the wall, and he dressed. He had dressed as a peasant, as an Austrian peasant, before he did it. Um, and he gets across, and he runs across a uh, machine gun, uh, like, encampment there for, from the SS. And he's looking, he's trying to look like he's picking at berries. So he's trying to look like he's a poor Austrian peasant just trying to feed himself. And so they look at him, they laugh at him, and they're like, oh, you fool, you know, whatever. And what he does is he actually stops and he pees on a tree. He pees on a tree right in front of the machine gun, uh, you know, uh, guys. And then he walks off and he sprints uh, to Vorgel and he meets with Major Kramers, right, the American guy with the tanks. And he said, hey, I'm here. I just got out of the castle. And thank God there was a um, there was a journalist who was traveling with the with the, the tanks, and he goes, "Oh my God, you're the tennis star!" And so at that point, the major goes, "Okay, this guy's for real." He was like, "Oh my God, this is yeah. Parajra. He's great." Um, and so he leads them over the bridge and into. And so at the darkest moment, when the when the prisoners think they're dead, when all of the you know, and this is like the money moment, right? You got you look up sure. at the walls. You see these prime ministers with their guns. You see them <laughs> Herbach guys. You see the rugged GI guys, right? You see yeah. you see the tank in the gate, and you see the 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 SS. They're all moving in, all moving in, all moving in. Yeah. So they think you know you got these guys, and that's the moment I picture Mike is like all of this motley crew of prisoners and Wehrmacht guys and GIs, and they're all up there. Oh, the SS guy, right? The captain. He's up there and they're firing at the SS. And but they, you know, they know they can't stop them because they got freaking anti-aircraft guns. And then they hear the squeal of the tanks coming behind them yeah. from Kramers. And the and the and the SS realize we're <laughs> like yeah. we're sandwiched here. We can't get in there. They're behind us. And the Americans come and they start wiping them out. They start wiping out that Panzer division from behind. And whoever didn't die. They were captured. Whoever wasn't captured, they escaped into the woods, and that was it. Um, there are some very, very, very touching photos um, that I found online of these guys with their 
God, they dress so brilliantly in the 30s and 40s. <laughs> they just did. And they have these suits on that they had kept with them and these overcoats. And they're they're posing on the courtyard at the castle with the well, of course you you got to wear your full three piece suit if one is uh, yeah b- battling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is so funny, and, and and you know what's significant about this battle too. Um, so I knew a little bit about it, but I didn't know this much. Is unless I'm mistaken, this is the only battle, the only true battle. That, there were firefights and there were skirmishes, but this is the only true battle where the Wehrmacht fought against the SS. And mm-hmm. The key thing, you know, they say that a lot of the the downfall of the German Wehrmacht was that they were too good with following orders, that they followed orders blindly. But it's my understanding that their officers had said, listen, the Wehrmacht is on this side now, and we have officially, you know, signed a pact with this this other side, with the Americans. And because of that, it is now our duty to fight for this side. And that the Wehrmacht guys were like, okay, right? Yeah. And that'd be fascinating, fascinating, fascinating. And this is also, you know, it's also one of two battles in World War II. And maybe we devote an episode to the other one sometime. Have you heard about the, the Battle of Mares el Kabir? No. So that was a battle in the early days of the war where the French army had been captured by, you know, uh, the, the French capital and government had been captured by the Germans. And the, the, the puppet French government had said to the French army and the French Navy, we are fighting on the side of the Germans. And it's an answer to another trivia question, which is what's the only battle in World War II where the English fought the French? There was an ugly battle where Churchill, he instructed the, the British Navy to bomb the French Navy, which was crazy. And they actually had a, ma- a massive battle in Algeria, if I remember correctly. But what a great story, David. I, mean, Dude, I can't believe this is not in a movie. I mean, have yeah. like, you have like, you know, you could have Matt Damon. That's right? what I was saying. You know Matt Damon playing somebody. He's going to play the plucking. Yeah, right, right. I, I have Brad Pitt as Gangle, right? The sure. army guy. Um, and then you got like, you know, Ben Affleck could be like Major Kramer's coming with the tanks in the back. You gotta have Ted Danson and maybe Tom Hanks in there some, somewhere. Yeah, yeah, calling the shots. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Dude, it, it, this, I, I, how has nobody made this a movie? It has every single element. That shot alone of that, you know, that plucky group uh, folks thrown together under circumstance. Yeah. The crenaded walls of the castle shutting yeah. down. You know, you got Matt Robert Dowdy Jr. as the, the aging tennis star. <laughs> I love it. I, love I know. It. You got the tennis star. Yes, I forgot about that. Yeah, I mean, Jesus. This is such a great, this is such a great story. I I, I almost cried. I laughed. I smiled. It, it just made me, it made me so happy. But yeah, Castle Litter. Battle of Castle Litter. Fantastic story. And I hope all of you watching it made you smile, laugh, and learn something that you didn't know. Please don't forget to click like. It's very important to us. Throw us a comment. And we'll see you next time. Hey, if you like what you hear, like and subscribe. It really means a lot. And we would love to have you coming back every week. Thank you.